All right, well, we just finished our series last week, so we're starting a brand new series today. For the next several weeks, I'm not sure how many weeks it's going to take. I've got several of them lined up and more kind of forming in my mind. But we're going to be looking at the church. We're going to be looking at the church as a whole, um, as it exists today. But more specifically, we're going to be looking at this particular body of believers. But the most important thing we're going to do is we're going to go back to our roots. We're going to go back to the beginning of the church and see if we here are doing what God intended us to do as a church. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I want to focus on the words, my church. And if you have your your bullet, then you'll see I crossed out my and put his. How often do you hear the words, my church? Or how often do you use the words, my church? We hear people say, I love my church. Hopefully some of you guys say that to your friends. I love my church. You should come to my church. My church believes. My church does. My church is going to do. My church is going to a Mariners game. My church doesn't do. I wish my church would. I wish my church didn't. We use those words, my church, all the time. And while really in most of those statements, there are some of those statements maybe we shouldn't use, but in most of those statements, there's nothing wrong with it. I hope you love your church. There's nothing wrong with my church. But when we say my church, we often forget this really isn't our church. It's his church. And some of those statements we say, I wish my church would or I wish my church wouldn't, It's really saying it's mine and I want what I want when really we should be focusing on what does he want. This is his church and we get to be part of his church. Stephen Keisha just joined his church, this particular congregation, but it's his church. It's not my church. Jesus didn't say, I will build your church the way you want it. Or I will build a church if it's your theology. And does everything to your liking. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to build a church that you feel comfortable in. Because you know what? If it's really Jesus' church, there are probably some things we won't feel comfortable with. If we're very comfortable, we're probably not in his church. We're in our church. Because Jesus sometimes said some things that offended people. And he asked us to do some things that put us out of our comfort zone. So if we're totally comfortable and never getting challenged, we've probably created our own church and we're not attending his church any longer. Jesus said he would build his church and the gates of hell would not be able to stand against his church. He didn't say, my church, if I build my church, hell can have its heyday in my church. But in his church, hell can try all at once, but he will hold back those gates of hell. When we read the book of Acts, we read about the explosive growth in the early church. What was it that caused that growth? People were listening to God and doing things his way. But it wasn't too long before the churches began to build their their own church. They wanted a church that suited them. Most of Paul's epistles, and we're going through one of those right now on Wednesday nights, we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians, most of his epistles were addressed to a particular church that had problems because they weren't focused anymore on just God. They were focused on what I like, what I want, what fits my agenda. And so he had to write these letters to the churches trying to correct their stinking thinking and say, you need to get back to his way of thinking. Stop being selfish. Stop thinking about yourselves. What did God want? So he wrote the epistles to try to correct the way they're thinking. God addresses the issue himself in the seven letters that he wrote to the churches in Revelation. He addressed some of the things that had crept into the church. They were no longer acting like his church. They had become selfish. They had started doing their things their way, trying to create a church they were comfortable with. Throughout history, we've seen spurts of church growth, followed by plateau and eventually decline. If we study what the early church did and compare that to every revival that has ever existed, we find similarities. Although technology, culture, styles, etc. keep changing, there are certain things that have proven to work throughout history. When we're listening to God and following his pattern for the church, it works. When we ignore his blueprint and try to build something on our own, it fails. Psalms 127.1, part of that verse says, Unless the Lord builds the house, 
the builders labor in vain. If God is not in charge of this church, if we're not building the church according to his plan, this church will fail. But if we build it according to his blueprint, we will succeed because he will build his church. The more I study the book of Acts and the more I study past revivals, and I love to study past revivals. I love to read the history of revivals and what happened and the condition the world was in before the revival and what happened through the revival and what brought the revival. The more I study Acts and revivals, the more I realize how far we've strayed from God's original design for the church. It's time for another course correction. It's time to get back to helping Christ build his church. So what did the church that Jesus built look like? Acts chapter 2 gives us some hints. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, the first part of the verse says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Does that sound like a church you'd like to be a part of? That sounds like an exciting church, doesn't it? But you know what? Apparently, other people, because of what we just read, apparently other people liked that too. Because the result of what they did, the last part of the verse says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice that word Lord. The Lord added to their number. They didn't do a big advertising campaign. They didn't have a full page ad on the church section of the newspaper. They didn't have a big a billboard out front. They didn't have a church sign where they put a fancy message on there. They didn't even have a building to meet in. The Lord added to their number because they were doing what the Lord wanted them to do. They grew without a fancy church building. They didn't have exciting programs like Sunday school, Royal Rangers, youth group, choir. They had no programs. None of those things are wrong. I'm not saying programs are wrong. Programs are tools to help us accomplish a goal, but programs in their themselves will not build a church. God didn't say, if you have Sunday school, your church will grow. If you had Royal Rangers, your church will grow. If you had an organ, or if you had a piano, or if you have a cross on the wall, or if you have small groups, those are all tools. But without the other ingredients in place, none of those things will do any good. Today I want to talk about prayer. Because I believe that prayer is the most important factor in a successful church. Now, when I say successful, we need to keep in mind that what God sees as success and what man sees as a success aren't, off, aren't always the same thing. We often think that a church is successful just because it draws big crowds, because it has big programs, great facilities. But, you know, a charismatic leader can build a crowd. A program can build, can, can, can build a crowd. But sometimes you can have a crowd and still have no spiritual depth. You can have a large church and nobody getting saved. See, what God sees as success is not how many people are sitting in the seats, but how many people are coming to Christ. It says the Lord added to their number daily. And it wasn't just, excuse my, my English here, it wasn't just butts in the seat. It was hearts changed. We focus on numbers. How many people do we have here what God says is how many lives are being changed. How many people are brand new Christians coming to Christ? See, we get excited when somebody comes from another church across town. They don't like their church anymore, and so they leave there and they come here, and we get excited. Yes, God gave us another body! But they already knew Jesus. I'm thankful for those people. As long as they come and they get involved. See, I don't need somebody bringing their problems from another church into my church. Now, if they'll come in and they've got experience and they'll come in and they'll get involved and they'll help us reach the community and they'll get involved in serving or teaching a class or they'll get involved in the life of the church, get involved in doing the real mission of the church, I get excited about that. Because the more people we have doing the mission, the more God's church grows. But we get excited just about people. 
God says, so what? You got lots of people. Where's the spiritual depth? What are they learning? Are they growing? Are they out witnessing? Are they out doing what I asked them to do? God's success is how many people are coming to Christ. There are several things that are mentioned in the passage in Acts 2.47 that I read. It says they devoted themselves, the apostles, teaching to the fellowship, the breaking of bread. The last thing it mentions in that first part there is prayer. It's the last thing mentioned, but I want to focus on that first because I think prayer is the most important part and it's the foundational part. The other stuff would not have happened without the prayer. Charles Spurgeon once said, the condition of the church may be very accurately gauged by its prayer meetings. If God be near a church, it must pray. And if he not be there, one of the first tokens of his absence will be a slothfulness in prayer. Jesus himself said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. If God's church is supposed to be a house of prayer, why is there so little prayer going on in most of our churches today? I dare you to show me any major revival or ministry that has ever happened without a foundation of prayer. Jesus himself spent 40 days fasting and praying before he launched his public ministry. He went out and got alone with his father for 40 days. Nothing to eat, nothing to drink, just focused on God talking to his father. He prayed before he started doing anything. And throughout the Gospels, we read about the importance that Jesus put on prayer. He was constantly taking time away from his other activities to spend time in prayer. Sometimes he prayed alone. Other times he prayed with the disciples. But the foundation of Jesus' ministry was prayer. If Jesus, God's own son, needed to pray in order to be successful, how in the world do we expect to be successful without prayer? The disciples watched Jesus and tried to follow the techniques and formulas that he used. In Mark chapter 9, there's a story about a time when Jesus was busy ministering to the crowds. And there were so many people that the disciples decided they could help out. I mean, they've been with Jesus for a couple of years. They saw what he did. They, they heard the words that he said. They saw how he laid his hands on them, all that kind of stuff. They said, we can start. So they started calling people over. Hey, you don't even see Jesus. Come over here. Actually, that's biblical because Jesus said you can do even greater things. He actually hadn't spoken those words yet at this point in the scripture. But they said, we've been watching Jesus. We know the techniques. We know exactly how to do it. So a man came, brought his son who was demon-possessed. And they decided they were going to cast the demons out. They'd seen Jesus cast demons out. It's not that tough. You just speak the words, the demons go. So they did exactly what Jesus did, probably repeated the exact same words that Jesus said the last time he cast demons out of somebody, and nothing happened. So finally the man brought him to Jesus, and Jesus immediately just spoke the words, said, leave, and the, 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 the demons left, and the crowds were amazed. How come they did it for Jesus, and they didn't do it for these disciples? And the disciples later on came to Jesus. When they were alone, they said, Jesus, how come it worked for you? but it didn't work for us. Mark chapter 9, verses 28 to 29. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. We can't do what we're supposed to do without prayer. We can do little things. But if we want to do the big things, it takes more time in prayer. The more we pray, the more things begin to happen. We must pray. But pr the prayer Jesus was talking about wasn't just a quick prayer, because they did pray. They said, come out of the man. That was a prayer. That's not the kind of prayer Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the kind of prayers where he went alone and he spent hours or 40 days on his knees talking to the Father. It's the prayer beforehand. It's not just the prayer. We lay our hands on somebody and say, say, be well. That's scriptural. But have we been bathing that time in prayer prior to? We have to prepare for that single prayer by having a lifetime of prayer. That's where the success from the early church came from. Jesus told the disciples that they would be able to do even greater things than he had done. They had seen him do those things, but those things didn't start to happen until they spent extended times in prayer. Prayer was so important, the last instruction Jesus gave them was to not attempt to do anything until they received power. He said, leave here, go lock yourselves in a room, and don't do anything, because on your own, you will not be successful. You need the power that I will give, and that power is not going to come unless you spend time in 
prayer. So they went. In fact, it was just about this time of the year, actually three days ago, because next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and it was on Pentecost Sunday the baptism of the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit fell. They had spent ten days praying for that power before it finally came. When's the last time you spent ten days praying for anything? And I mean intensified prayer because you might pray for the same thing for 10 days in a row, but it's a quick two-minute, okay, I've done it, I'm, I'm done. That's not the type of prayer the Bible teaches. That's not the type of prayer Jesus demonstrated. It's not the type of prayer Jesus talked about. We need intense, concentrated times of prayer. Jesus said, don't leave until, don't do anything, don't even try to build a church because you can build a church on your own. Lots of people have built churches on their own. Just get a good charismatic preacher up there. You can build a church. Or, you know, promise everybody that if they give so much money, they'll get blessed. And you can build a big church doing that. That's not the kind of Jesus said, don't build your church. Build my church. And if you want to build my church, you must pray. You have to have that foundation of prayer. Jesus didn't start his ministry till he spent 40 days in prayer. The early church didn't begin until the disciples spent 10 days in prayer. And it was the continual gathering of the church to pray that brought the results that the early church saw. Throughout the book of Acts, we read about the church gathering together for corporate prayer. And every time after they gathered together to spend time in prayer, miracles started happening. One time when they were praying, the prison doors were opened and Peter got to walk free because the church got together and they prayed. Prayer changes things. Prayer makes things happen. Actually, it's God making the things happen, but unless we pray, those things won't happen. But it wasn't long before the power began to wane. They stopped praying. And when they stopped praying, they lost the intimate connection with God. They no longer heard the voice of God. So they started focusing on programs and methods. I mean, we know how to do these things. We've been doing these things for so long. We can just continue to do them. But once the power of God is taken out of programs, programs die. They can't sustain themselves without God's power. Programs and methods work if they're birthed in prayer and have the power of God behind them. But a program without God's power is just a program. If we look at church history, we can see a pattern that repeats itself over and over again. A powerful praying church begins to operate in its own strength, doing things the way they've always done, but pretty soon, things don't seem to be working anymore. Why did they work then and they don't work now? Well, it's because then you were praying about it. Now you're just doing it. They're still doing all the right things. It's just not working anymore. Sometimes it's because the programs and methods have become stagnant. Those programs were birthed in prayer for a time and season, but the season has passed. See, sometimes we want to just do something because it worked in the past, and we want to continue doing it. Sometimes God says, no, that was for that time and season. This is a new time and season. The gospel's not going to change, but you need to change the methods. You need to change the way you're doing it. But that only comes out of prayer as we talk to God. God reveals to us, time to put that one on the shelf. Let's do this one instead, because this is going to meet the people that you have to minister today. E.M. Bounds, a famous preacher from years ago, said, The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men. Men of prayer. Now, we could put women of prayer in there, too. Back when Ian Bounds was preaching, they didn't talk about the women much, but men and women of prayer. That's what God works through, is men and women of prayer. Eventually, the ch church will wake up and figure out that they can't do things on, without God's power. They say, we've been trying, we've been trying. It's just not working. The final is, okay, we need to have God's power behind these things. So they get on their knees, and they start praying again. They pray continually. They pray fervently. They pray passionately. And finally, there's a breakthrough, and the church begins to grow again. Another quote from Ian Bounds. He says, every mighty, let me repeat that, every, every mighty move of the Spirit of God has had its source in the prayer chamber. A.T. Pearson said, there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. Things don't happen in the spiritual realm without prayer. I love studying revivals. I want to tell you about one of the great revivals that happened. Not 
too long before some of you were born, okay? A few, few years, but not, 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 not like a whole century. In the mid-1800s, America, a country that was founded on God, had become spiritually bankrupt. Drunkenness had become epidemic. Out of a population of 5 million, 300,000 were confirmed drunkards, and 15,000 per year were dying alcohol-related deaths. Profanity was of the most shocking kind. For the first time in the history of America, women were afraid to go out at night for fear of assault. Bank robberies were daily occurrences. What about the churches? The Methodists were losing more members than they were gaining. The Baptists said that they had had their most wintry season. The Presbyterians in General Assembly deplored the nation's ungodliness. One typical congregational church had not taken one young person into fellowship in 16 years. The Protestant Episcopal Bishop of New York had not confirmed anyone for so long that he quit and took other employment. The Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, wrote to the Bishop of Virginia, James Madison, that the church was too far gone to ever be redeemed. Tom Paine, one of the founding fathers of our nation, declared, Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years. A poll was taken at some of the major colleges that had been founded on Christ as Christian universities. It was discovered that there was not one believer in the whole student body of Harvard. Let me repeat that. Harvard. It was started as a Christian university, and when they polled the students, they could not even find one believer in the whole school. At Princeton, only two believers were found, and there were only five students in all of Princeton that didn't belong to the filthy speech movement of the day. Yes, that was a thing. I had to look that up. Filthy speech movement. It was actually a movement where young people actually got their thrills and actually kind of graded each other on how foul their language could be. They weren't saying it just because they didn't know any better. They were deliberately trying to see how filthy their language could be. I wonder if we've got some students in that movement today. That was actually a real thing back then. Only five students at Princeton didn't belong to that movement. Students rioted. They held a mock communion at Williams College, and they put on anti-Christian plays at Dartmouth. They burned down the prayer room in Nassau Hall at Princeton. They took a Bible out of a local Presbyterian church in New Jersey and burned it in a public bonfire. Christians were so few on campus in the 1790s that they met in secret, like a communist cell, and kept their minutes in code so that no one could, would know. That was right here in the United States. Kenneth Scott Lauderette, a great church historian, wrote, It seemed as if Christianity was about to be ushered out of the affairs of men. Churches had their backs to the wall. It seemed as if Christianity would soon be wiped out. But the church got desperate and began to call on God. In 1857, a Christian businessman named Jeremiah Lanfear started a prayer meeting in the upper room of the Dutch Reformed Church in Manhattan. In response to his advertisement, only six people out of a population of a million showed up. But the following week, there were 14, then 23. They decided to start meeting every day for prayer. By late winter, they were filling the Dutch Reformed Church, the Methodist Church on John Street, and the Trinity Episcopal Church on Broadway and Wall Street. In February and March of 1858, every church and public hall in downtown New York was filled. Horace Greeley, a famous editor, sent a reporter with horse and buggy racing around the prayer meetings to see how many men were praying. In one hour, he could only get to 12 meetings, but in those 12 meetings, he counted 6,100 men. The prayer meetings kept growing, and before long, there were more than 10,000 people per week being converted in New York City alone. The revival spread throughout New England. It raced up the Hudson and down the Mohawk. One Baptist church had so many people to baptize that they decided they couldn't wait for spring. So they went down to the river, cut a big hole in the ice, and baptized people in the ice-cold water. And we complained about this tank before we got a heater in it. The source I got this from added a notation. This is a Baptist church going down and baptizing in ice-cold water. And he said, if a Baptist church will do that, you know revival has broken out. 
The revival that I just described is what we know now as the Second Great Awakening. During the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, more than one million people were converted in one year out of a population of 10 million people. Let me repeat that again. At this time in U.S. history, there were 10 million people. I think we're at like 40 million in the U.S. now. At this time, there were only 10 million people in the United States. And in one year, 10 million, or excuse me, 1 million of the 10 million converted in one year. 10% in one year. How many would like to see that in America today? But why did it happen? Prayer. It wouldn't have happened without prayer. They said the church would probably be wiped out in 30 years, but this revived the church, and the church is still going today. We're seeing decline again, but that's what revived the church. One church in particular had 121 members in 1857, and three years later in 1860, it reported 1,400 members. Three years. Jumped from 121 to 1400. This great revival eventually jumped the Atlantic Ocean and touched Scotland, Wales, England, parts of Europe, South Africa, and South India. The effects of the revival were felt for 40 years, and eventually, with continued prayer by people who still wanted more of God, it gave way to the Azusa Street Revival in 1906, from which our own denomination, the Assemblies of God, was formed. But it happened because of, everybody say it, prayer. It wasn't great preachers that brought the revival, although the revival produced some great preachers. It wasn't great buildings or great programs, although some great buildings and some great programs came out of that as people sought God. God gave them vision for programs that would help sustain it and for buildings that they needed to build to house, to house the crowds. The Second Great Awakening happened the same way the First Great Awakening in 1720 through 1740 happened. Although that one didn't really come to the United States, that one happened over in Europe because the United States at that time was really still, that's the only period of time that we consider America really a Christian nation was back during that time. But Europe had become so, so uh, unchristian that there was a revival that broke out there. This time it started in the United States and then spread over to the other countries. But the Second Great Awakening happened the same way the First Great Awakening happened. And the same way that all other revivals in history have happened. The same way the early church in Acts was formed. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says what? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Why was Billy Graham so, success, so successful in his crusades? Was it because he was such a great preacher? He was an okay preacher, but you listen to his sermons. I mean, there's a lot of guys that preach a lot better sermon than Billy Graham. Billy Graham was very simple, very basic. It was just a simple salvation message. Why was it successful? The reason was because Thousands of people, or the reason thousands of people found Christ in his crusades was because he got local churches to start praying from the, for the crusade months before he ever came to town. Maybe some of you have been involved in some of those crusades in the past. Before he came to a town, he made sure he got a commitment from all the churches in town. They all needed to work together and have an, uh, regular prayer meetings to pray for the revivals, to pray for souls to be saved. And they had to agree that afterwards we will follow up with those people and we will plug them into a church. We will continue with it. He knew that without prayer, without God's anointing, he was nothing. He was just a man giving speeches. So people would pray for months prior to the crusade. That's why he was successful. And weeks before a crusade, his team would specifically target the next place they were going, and they would spend hours and hours, take time off from their book work and everything else they had to do, and they'd call a prayer meeting for his whole office. We're going to get together. We're going to pray for this crusade that we have coming up in three weeks. We're going to pray for God's anointing. We're going to pray for souls to be saved. J. Edgar Hoover, some of you guys recognize that name. He said, the spectacle of a nation praying is more awe-inspiring than the explosion of an at atomic bomb. The force of prayer is greater than any possible combination of man-made or man-controlled powers because prayer is man's greatest means of tapping the infinite resources of God. 
Invoking by prayer the mercy and might of God is our most effective means of guaranteeing peace and security for the harassed and helpless people of the earth. Wouldn't it be great to see our nation praying? It can happen, but it starts with one individual praying. And eventually a whole church starts praying. And then a whole community starts praying. That's what happened in New York City before the Second Great Awakening. It started with one man having the idea. And the first week he could only get five other people to join him. But it grew from there until pretty soon the whole city, not the whole city, but you know, majority of the city was praying. And it spread from there to cover the whole nation and the whole world. Paul gave these instructions to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. He said, I urge then, first of all, that petitions... Prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceably or peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He says, first of all, in other words, he's saying a primary importance, the most important thing is Pray for all people. Why? It tells us in the last part of the verse. Why do we pray? Because it pleases God, number one. Secondly, because God's will is for all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And people will not come to the knowledge of the truth unless we pray. That's the first step. Pray. Then God gets us to go, and it gives us the words. But that all comes out of prayer. Prayer is what gives us the, the courage and, and the wisdom and all those things to be his spokesman here on earth. It starts with us when we pray. Then God, God begins to move. I'd like to throw it out this morning that the most important service of the week here at Central Assembly is not what we're doing right now. This Sunday morning service is not the most important service of the week. Our small groups are great, but they're not the most important thing we do. Our Wednesday night Bible study is great, but it's not the most important thing we do. The most important service of the week here at Central Assembly is our Sunday night prayer service. And most of you, well, I'm not going to say most, but a lot of you are missing the most important service of the week. If you're too busy and you can only come to one service a week, do your chores on Sunday morning and come on Sunday night. That's where the power comes from. That's what's going to grow God's church. That's what's going to give us his vision, his passion for the lost. You need to be here on Sunday night. No excuses. Now I realize that some of you are going, prayer's boring. I want Sunday morning because, you know, I don't even know how to pray. Well, you're not going to learn how to pray if you don't come. If you could only make one service a week. Now, really, if you really evaluate your schedule and you look at things, you could make it to more than just one a week. We use that as an excuse. You know, we're in charge of our own schedules. But if you can actually only make it one time per week, Sunday night is where you need to be. That's when God's going to start bringing his revival. God's true church doesn't just pray at mealtime or before bed. God's church prays continually. They pray in private and in a corporate setting. I'm tired of hearing about drive-by shootings. I want to start hearing about some drive-by prayings. Drive through town and pray over the businesses as you go by. Pray for them that God will bless them. Pray for the owners that they'll get saved, for the employees that they'll get saved. There's a few businesses, maybe when you go by, you should pray that God will close them down. Okay? Drive by and pray. When you see somebody on the street corner, stop and say, God, I don't know that person, but you do. I don't know if they're a believer or not. God, I don't know what they need. I don't know what kind of problems they're going through. But God, I pray a blessing on their lives. Send somebody to speak into them. And if they're not believers, bring them to you. Let's start having some drive-by prayings. If you look at history, there has been a major revival every 100 to 150 years. In between times, there are minor revivals. I know we don't like to admit it, but Azusa Street was actually a minor revival that came out of the major revival, which was the Great Awakening. 
There's all these smaller revivals. We've had some in recent years, Brownsville and, and some other ones. And again, if you study those, they all started in prayer. In fact, I used to work for a pastor who was youth pastor in Brownsville. And when he was there, the church started having prayer meetings for revival for their city. And so years later, when the Brownsville revival broke out, he was always saying, I was part of that. I was part of the beginning. We're the ones that started praying, and that's why we're seeing. He was proud of the fact that he was in the beginning. He wasn't there for the actual revival, but he was part of the foundation by praying for their city of Brownsville. And that spread beyond Brownsville and touched many churches all over the nation, but it wasn't a major revival. But history shows that every 100 to 150 years, there is a major revival. It's time for another revival. I can hear the sound of the third great awakening. The church, God's church, is beginning to pray. Some of you, if you're here on Sunday nights, and I don't get much time to talk about on Sunday mornings, but we've been talking about the things that God is doing in this city. It's because we, on Sunday nights, have been praying for three years. We've been praying that God would give us this city, that God would reach our city council and our mayor and the police department and the people living on the streets. We've been praying, God, give us this city. We're not the only church. There are other churches that are praying. I've been part of a pastor's group that's been praying for two and a half years, praying for Yakima, praying that God would send revival to our city. What does God say? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear. And we are having major breakthroughs in our city. Why? Because we're praying. Taylor and I this week met with the principal at Davis High School talking about how we can be there. He's saying, I want you on my campus. I want you here having lunch with students. I want you here after school just hanging out with students. I don't know if you guys know, but that's pretty rare. In this society where separation of church and, church and state, our high school principals, our middle school principals, Taylor met with the... the the middle school principal from Lewis and Clark. He's hoping to get together with the Washington principal. The principal of Lewis and Clark says, I want you here talking to my students. I want you to help me develop some after-school programs for these kids because these kids are joining gangs because they go home to an empty house. They need something after school. Can you help me put together some programs for these students after school? So Taylor's looking at, you know, what can he do and how can we partner with them? Maybe we can't just get up and stand on a table in the lunchroom and preach the gospel. But it starts by relationship. In fact, all these principals have said that. They said, you can't come in here with a Bible and start, start yelling at the Bible. But once you build relationships with the students, they get to know you. They're going to start asking questions. And if they ask you a question, you can open your Bible. You can say anything you want to say if they bring it up. That's an open door. Why has it happened? Because we've prayed. I met down in the police chief's office on Monday. I think it was Monday of this week. Met down there with, with about... Uh, Ten other local pastors and the city manager, the police chief, or chief of police, and a lady that we're trying to get in to, to figure out how we can reach the, the gangs in the city. The Yakima Police Department and the city of Yakima is begging the churches. The only thing the city manager keeps saying is, get your congregation to do prayer walks. Just get them out there to adopt neighborhoods and just go out and pray over those neighborhoods. We need more prayer in our city. This is from a city manager. Please go out and pray. They're asking us, how can the church partner with us? How can we change the gang violence? How can we change all the things that happen? It's the city. We didn't go to them. They came to us. We've gone to the city. We've gone to the schools in years past. Taylor shared a story on last Sunday night. Five years ago, they went to the schools. They said, can we come have lunch? And they're basically shut down. No, you can't be here. You don't have any business being here. You can't be here. The only exception was if they had a student at the school, they could come have lunch with just that student. But they couldn't you know, meet with anybody else and stuff. Now... The schools are saying, we want you. They're knocking on our door. What made the difference? Prayer. Now, what will help speed things up? More prayer. We need to keep praying. We're at a prime opportunity to reach our city, to reach our state, to reach our nation. But it has to be birthed in prayer. I need more of you involved in prayer. God's church is a praying church. If we're not praying, we might as well just close these doors and go home. You know what? You can see better preachers on TVN, just being honest with you. If we're not praying, what are we doing? We're wasting our time because we can have the best programs in the world. They're not going to do it. 
without prayer, we need to pray. I'm begging you. The city's begging us. Get involved in the city. I'm begging you. If you call this church your home, join us in prayer. Get here on Sunday night. If you can't make it, at least be praying. And not just to now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and rub-a-dub-dub, thank God for the grub. That's easy prayer. Let's get on our knees. Let's get on our faces. Let's pray. Let's pray, God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. God, not my will, not my church, but your church here on earth. Let's pray. I want to see you here. If this is your church, join us because this church will be a praying church. If you, don't, if you want to go somewhere else, you don't like prayer, be my guest. Go somewhere else. Because as pastor of this church, I'm calling this church to pray because I'm getting my orders from God. That's what he's saying. He's saying, my church is a praying church. Do you want to be part of my church or do you want to form your own? We will be a praying church. Please join us for prayer. There are at least two people in this room. I'm not going to tell you who they are right now. Okay? And I don't have time for them to come to talk. There are at least two people in this church that are here in this church. Because, well, one specifically God told them to come to this church. But both of them, God said, go to Yakima. They were not living in Yakima. They had roots in Yakima. But God said, go back to Yakima and start praying because I am going to send revival to Yakima. It's been promised. God wants to send revival. It's promised. How soon will it happen? I can't tell you, but it's, it's starting to happen now. But it's going to happen faster if we get involved in God's business of prayer. We need to pray. Heavenly Father, we don't want to be just our church. We like our church. Many of us like it just the way it is. We don't want it to change. We're comfortable. But that's the problem. We're comfortable. You never asked your people to be comfortable. You said if anyone wants to come after me, they have to take up their cross. That doesn't sound comfortable. You said my house will be called a house of prayer. We want to be your church. We want to do what you want us to do, and it's only going to happen through prayer. So I pray that you would help us to take prayer seriously. Help all of us. If we spend 15 minutes a day in prayer right now, let us double that to 30. If we spend 30, let us double it to an hour. If we spend an hour, let us double it to, to two hours. And let us keep increasing that prayer. Let us never get satisfied with how much time we spend with you. Let us be people of prayer so that we can help you build your church. Amen.